Today we're going to talk about nutrient, phytoplankton, zooplankton, detritus, or NPZD models. These are commonly used tools in oceanography, so it is important to understand how they work, and it's also important for your homework. This is fairly dense material, so I'm going to try to keep this lecture short, and I expect plenty of questions on Tuesday. An outline for today's lecture is, first, what are NPZD models? Second, what's the purpose of NPZD models? Third, how do we add complexity to these models? Fourth, how do we couple them to physics? And then at the end, we're actually going to talk about how you construct an NPZD model. So first off, what are NPZD models? Well, basically, they're models of the very most basic parts of a phytoplankton ecosystem, going from nutrients to phytoplankton to zooplankton to, to detritus and back to nutrients. These are simple, dynamic, concentration-based models that describe how um, nitrogen moves through an ecosystem. You typically start off with a nutrient that gets taken up by phytoplankton. The phytoplankton um, produces some detritus through phytoplankton mortality, uh, and some of the phytoplankton get consumed by zooplankton. The zooplankton can ingest detritus as fecal pellets, or they can excrete nitrogen as nutrients. They can also consume some detritus, and the detritus itself can be remineralized back to nitrogen. So we've got a very simple little ecosystem. We're just parameterizing how nitrogen flows through this ecosystem, but it's important to keep in mind that what we're modeling here is concentrations. We're modeling the concentration of phytoplankton, usually in nitrogen units, the concentration of zooplankton in nitrogen units, the concentration of detritus, and the concentration of nutrients all in uh, nitrogen units. We're basically just figuring out how much nitrogen is in each of these compartments. We're not modeling individual organisms. At their core, NPZD models are really a set of differential equations that quantify an oversimplified understanding of food web interactions. So they're basically just trying to boil the model down, model the, they're, sorry, they're trying to boil the pelagic ecosystem down into the simplest possible set of equations that we could use to understand how it behaves. You should really think of individual models as hypotheses. Scientists, when they build a model, they're putting in what they think is the most important components of an ecosystem. So they're really constructing a hypothesis about how they, that ecosystem behaves. That model then may or may not sufficiently characterize the crucial components of the system that are necessary to answer a specific question. That arrow represents phytoplankton nutrient uptake. So we're going to write some sort of equation that describes how we think phytoplankton nutrient uptake is regulated by maybe nutrient concentration and the light available to the phytoplankton. You can think of the transfer functions as the verbs that describe how energy or matter is transported and transformed within the ecosystem. Individual trans transfer functions describe specific ecosystem processes. As I said, this transfer function here is going to describe nutrient uptake uh, by the phytoplankton. And it's going to be dependent on the nutrient concentration, the light availability, and also how many phytoplankton you have. This transfer function here is the one that describes grazing of phytoplankton by zooplankton. So this transfer function here might have that Hollings type 1 or Hollings type 2 or Hollings type 3 equation depending on how we think the ecosystem behaves. Here's another transfer function that could be in the model. That's zooplankton excretion rates. They mediate the conversion of nitrogen from the zooplankton state variable to the nitrogen to the nutrient state variable. So that might be modeled as, say, a function of the uptake of the phytoplankton plus some basal excretion rate that the zooplankton have. The term NPZD model specifically refers to a model that has as its state, state variable nutrient, phytoplankton, zooplankton, and detritus. However, NPZD-like models are basically just any models that, have, that model the ecosystem as these concentrations. So NPZD-type models can have varying levels of complexity. The earliest models were just NPZ models. These didn't have detritus. They were just nutrients, phytoplankton, and zooplankton. And they were sort of the basic things that people originally thought were essential to understand cycling through the ecosystem. Detritus was eventually added because it allows for a lag time between organism death or zooplankton fecal production and its remineralization to the nutrient pool.
and also in a multi-dimensional model, say a 1D model that has vertical structure or a 3D model of the whole ocean. Detritus also allows you to um, include sinking in these models. So you can have detritus sink from the surface down into the deep ocean. Additional models have added many, many additional state variables and transfer functions to incorporate additional processes. For instance, some models include different phytoplankton functional groups. Maybe they add diatoms, maybe they add nitrogen fixers, maybe they add coccolithophores or picoplankton. Some have added different mesozoal plankton functional groups. So the basic NPZD type model, we would probably think of the zooplankton as behaving kind of like a protist because protists do most of the grazing in the ocean. But we know that protists behave very differently from, say, a copepod, so maybe we want to add a copepod. Or maybe we want to add krill and salps if we want to understand, um, for instance, how those two groups might change in the southern ocean. Some models have added bacteria to explicitly include remineralization from dissolved organic matter to uh, nutrients. Other models uh, include additional nutrient pools. If you want to model diatoms, you probably want to include silica in your model. If you want to model nitrogen fixers, you probably want to include phosphorus because phosphorus is uh, often limiting for nitrogen fixing organisms. Think about phytoplankton here. The amount of phytoplankton is going to be determined by how much nutrients they take up, how much they get grazed by zooplankton, and how much they die. So if you look at how I've color coded these, these are going to show up as this equation here and say how would the ecosystem change if we make the phytoplankton growth rate faster? Or how would the ecosystem change if we make the half saturation constant lower? How would this change the overall dynamics of how the ecosystem behaves? The second possible use explanation of observations is a very important uh, way these models tend to be used. Say you've gone out in the field and you've observed a particular phenomenon in the ocean. Maybe you've observed that phytoplankton biomass is substantially higher at a front. Then you might come up with some hypotheses for why phytoplankton biomass was enhanced at that front. Maybe there's increased nutrient injection. Maybe there is entrainment of phytoplankton into the uh, front. You then can create a model and see if the model dynamics can explain the phenomenon that you saw in the environment based on the hypothesis that you've created. For instance, we know that there's a large phytoplankton bloom that forms in the North Atlantic every year. And it's hypothesized to be due to shoaling of the mixed layer in con conjunction with increased uh, light availability. This is a theory known as critical depth theory. We can try and test this theory by parameterizing a simple NPZD model to behave like the phytoplankton in the North Atlantic, and then force this model with interannual mixed layer depth and sea surface irradiance, and ask does the model accurately predict the timing of the bloom based on differences in when the um, mixed layer shallows and when the um, light levels increase. So we could use the NPZD model as an explicit test of whether or not critical depth theory is actually correct. And finally the third uh, purpose of NPZD models and ultimately this is often what people are really trying to move towards with the NPZD models is prediction. If we believe that we understand something about the ecosystem, then we can create a model to try and look at how things will change in the future. If our model is accurate, we can predict how the ecosystem will change if we change the forcing on the model. Let's say we change the surface temperature or we change the ocean acid acidity, both things that we expect to change as a result of climate change. Or perhaps we'll change the top-down pressure. For instance, we know that fish are we know that overfishing has been happening throughout the oceans. So if we think that the top-down pressure on zooplankton is being decreased, we might change that in our model. It's important to keep in mind that models are like hypotheses and that you can never prove that your model is accurate. You can only disprove a model. But if you think that your model is accurate, you can start predicting 
what might happen in the future. Keep in mind always that no model is correct. All models are oversimplifications of an incredibly complex system. The question that you need to ask when evaluating a model is does it represent the crucial dynamics sufficiently well? If it does, you can use it for prediction. If it doesn't, you can't. And ultimately, just determining whether or not it accurately describes the dynamics is the most difficult part of modeling studies. The next thing that I want to talk about is adding complexity to these models because ultimately we know that the ecosystem is much more complex than a simple NPZD type model. If you think about the biological pump which I focus on studying a lot of the time which is really looking at the processes that drive carbon flux from the surface into the deep ocean we know that the biological pump is related to how dense sinking particles are and the density of sinking particles is often determined by how much silica they have in them which ultimately is derived from diatoms. Sinking particles are often also um, derived from mesozoal plankton fecal pellets. So a simple NPZD type model doesn't include diatoms, it doesn't include mesozoal plankton. So I would probably want to expand on an NPZD model if I want to understand what's going on with the biological pump. This is often true in the studies that people want to do. They have added compartments, added state variables that, that they think are important to the system and that they want to include in their models. For instance, the spring bloom that we talk, just talked about often requires the rapid growth rates of diatoms and their ability to escape protozoan grazing pressure. So you would need to add diatoms to the model if you want to include that sort of dynamic. If you want to model oligotrophic regions, those re regions often rely on diazotrophs to add new nitrogen that they fix from dinitrogen gas. So if you're going to model that sort of area, you may need to add diazotrophs to your model. Or sometimes investigators are interested in taxa or processes that are not represented in a basic NPZD model. Sometimes they're particularly focused in maybe coccolith fours in the North Atlantic. Or maybe the focus of their study is looking at changing nitrogen to phosphorus ratios in phytoplankton. You can't look at nitrogen to phosphorus ratios in a basic NPZD model because it doesn't have phosphorus. But if you added phosphorus to the model, now you could suddenly include dynamics that allow for um, changing elemental stoichiometry within the plankton. In any of these cases, it becomes necessary to add state variables and add extra transfer functions to the model. Some of the most commonly added state variables are diatoms and mesozooplankton, because these are two really important taxa. Nitrogen-fixing cyanobacteria are very often added, and so are additional nutrient pools. This graph on the right is showing you a model um, called the Nemro model by Kishi et al. in 2007. And this is a very commonly used model for studying zooplankton and um, even up to small fish dynamics in the uh, in a lot of the areas around the ocean. One of my grad students is now ad adapting this model to try and model the Gulf of Mexico. But this model now has the uh, nitrogen nutrient pool has been split into ammonia and nitrate. They've added silicic acid um, as an additional nutrient pool. They've got two phytoplankton, small phytoplankton and large phytoplankton. We've got dissolved organic nitrogen and particular organic nitrogen, which is basically the detritus from a normal um, uh, NPZD model. We've got small zooplankton, which are basically protists. We've got large zooplankton, which are basically copepods. And then we've got predatory zooplankton as well. And then these predatory zooplankton are assumed to be consumed by fish that are not included in the model. Another uh, type of model that's getting much more common use since it was first introduced by McFollows in 2007 is called an emergent property model. In an emergent property model, you basically model dozens of plankton that are modeled allometrically or by randomly assignment, uh, random assignment of parameterizations. So instead of basically saying, we think we know exactly how this phytoplankton behaves, they might create 70 different phytoplankton and randomly assign different traits to those phytoplankton and then release those 70 phytoplankton in a model of the global environment. And this, what this emergent properties model does is it allows the environment to select which of these 
taxa will succeed in each ecosystem. So it's allowing for the, uh, the ecosystem community to be an emergent property of the model. Um, these emergent property models can then be used for a lot of different purposes. This graph here shows biogeographical regions that have been, uh, been assigned based on the dominant phytoplankton types in the model. So if you think about the normal NPZD type model, it only has one type of phytoplankton. This model now, in each of these different regions, each of these color-coded regions, a different type of phytoplankton is dominant. So it's saying that each of these are specific ecosystems that behave differently. So that's the sort of thing that you could never figure out with a simple NPZD model. Another thing that you can do with an emergent property model like this is look at um, phytoplankton species abundance. Look at diversity. This graph here shows the number of phytoplankton species found in different regions of the model. So you can see this is predicting that in the subtropical gyre and in some of the um, and in the eastern tropical Pacific there will be higher diversity than there will be in some of the polar regions. So adding this complexity to the model allows you to address different questions that you could never address with an NPZD type model. A new type of model called the genome model that was actually just developed last year models specific genes of interest and randomly assigns those genes to model taxa. So they might model, say, um, the gene for nitrate transport or the gene for light harvesting centers in phytoplankton and randomly assign some of those genes to individual organisms. Those individual organisms then essentially get a genome comprised by some of the different genes that were included in the model and based on the genes that they that each organism receives and again this is a model that may have 70 or 80 different randomly assigned planktonic groups the genes that they get affect their sinking rate their nutrient uptake their light saturation they really affect every single one of those transfer functions that relate the uh, growth of the organism to its environment and then you can model over time how these different organisms be and the really powerful thing about this new genome model is that model outputs can then be compared to the results from modern metagenomics and metatranscriptomic studies. This is a graph from the Coles et al. model, and in the Coles et al. study, uh, they modeled the abundance of a couple different genes. This is the AMTB gene, which, uh, my, uh, which is used for uptake of ammonia. And so they modeled where this uh, gene was found in the environment. And then they compared it to measurements of that actual gene abundance that were made by people, by researchers working in the field. And so they found that the model was doing a decent job of predicting where this gene should be found. And the model can also predict the transcription of that gene. So if we look over here, the model is again being compared to um, transcriptomics data which quantify the transcription or how much of that gene is being is being how much that gene is being used to produce um, how much it's being transcribed to create RNA for building proteins so if we compare these two graphs we found that the gene is very widely spread throughout the ocean but it's only being transcribed in some areas where it's particularly useful When thinking about these models, it's important to keep in mind that there are almost as many models as there are modelers. New models get developed to answer specific questions in the ocean, but you should always keep in mind that the more state variables you add, and the more transfer functions, and the more parameters you add, the more difficult it becomes to parameterize the model, and the more difficult it becomes to falsify it. Ultimately, our goal as science is to try and disprove hypotheses. It's by disproving hypotheses that we move the field forward. The trick is to create the least complicated model that can accurately represent the dynamics of interest. The next topic that I want to cover is how these models actually get coupled to physics. And this is really important because ultimately physics is a huge driver of uh, community dynamics in the pelagic realm. 
And if we want to predict things like how the community will evolve with climate change, coupling these communities to changes in the physics is absolutely crucial. In an NPZD model, the equations govern what happens in an individual box of the model. And by adding different boxes, we can allow coupling to the physics. So if we look at this figure on the right here, this is saying, let's say we had an NPZD model and we wanted to look at how things change with depth. So in this model, we'd have, we've, this is a really, really simple coupled model. We've got three boxes one that's from 0 to 10 meters, one from 10 to 20, one from 20 to 30. And of course the light levels are going to change as we go down in the ocean. You've got more light here, less light here, less light down here. And so that's going to be a physical forcing on the model. And within each of these boxes we will run all of our, all the equations describing all of our transfer functions. And then we'll also run a separate physical model that determines how much of the water from this box goes into the, this box and vice versa, and how much goes from this box to this box, and vice versa. So that allows these boxes to exchange portions of their community. So maybe if you've got a relatively high mixing rate, maybe 10% of this box gets mixed into that box every day. And also maybe the detritus from this box is sinking down slowly deeper into the water column. So this is how we couple our uh, NPZD models to the physical models. We're calculating from this equation here times that time step. We do the same thing for all of the different state variables and then we just iterate this process and do it again and again and again to model how the system is evolving in time. That's all we've got for today. I expect that you guys will have plenty of questions for me on Tuesday. Have a good weekend.